Welcome everybody to Lunch with the Friends, day two of our Climate Week. My name is Maya Swope and I am the Outreach Coordinator here for Friends of the Boundary Waters. For anyone not familiar with our work, Friends of the Boundary Waters has been a leader in protecting the Boundary Waters wilderness for more than 40 years um, and we're really committed to working with people, with communities to protect the wilderness, to educate folks about the wilderness, um, and to kind of build awareness and fight for clean water. That's what we're all about. Um, and as part of that, we're really recognizing that, you know, climate is so tied to clean water and to the future of the Boundary Waters and for all of us who interact with it. Um, so we're excited to be continuing this Climate Week presentation. Um, as you may know, a lot of world leaders are meeting right now in Glasgow at an international climate summit. And so we're kind of hosting this presentation here to bring that conversation home, to talk about how some of these big topics relate to the Boundary Waters and to other things in our communities here. Um, so just a few kind of housekeeping notes. We will be recording this. Um, and so anyone um, is able to get the recording at the end. Don't need to take any notes um, if you're wondering about how to get this information afterwards. We also will have a question and answer period towards the end. There's a Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. So feel free to add questions throughout the presentation and we will get to as many as we're able to towards the end. And then finally in the chat function, if anyone is having technical issues or wants to just add some side comments during the um, presentation, um, the chat is a great place for that. So I would like to um, kind of just dive right into it. I'm excited to introduce you to Dr. William Rahm. He grew up in Ely, Minnesota, just on the edge of the Boundary Waters, and has made his way to the NYU School of Global Public Health, um, and is kind of an expert in lots of different topics related to climate, public health. So we're really lucky to have him on board today. Um, and I will go ahead and turn it right over to you. So thanks for being here so much. Thank you, Maya. Welcome to a seminar on climate change. Uh, we'll cover some of the science of climate change, a little bit of the public health, ecology, and then policy. Uh, what Maya didn't tell you is I'm a 1963 graduate of Ely Memorial High School, and I grew up as a wilderness guide for my father at Canoe Country Outfitters and was a guide in the Boundary Waters in Quetico. It was a great time in the 60s, uh, and then early in the 70s, I even had a chance to lobby with uh, Bud Heinzelman uh, for the uh, Boundary Waters Canoe Act uh, Wilderness Bill, uh, which was a lot of fun. And I've been going back to our Burnside Lake cabin every, sum every summer since. Uh, I've realized it's gotten a lot hotter. Uh, we even had heat waves as well as forest fires last summer. We had a severe drought and then some severe derecho winds that knocked down many trees and upended the entire Blueberry Festival in Ely. Uh, so climate change, as the science has been around for more than a century, if you'd believe, Savanti Arrhenius has described the uh, global warming that would occur from increased greenhouse gases on the surface of the earth in 1898 and received the Nobel Prize for this in chemistry in 2003. So on this uh, slide, you can see the uh, average temperature in the continental US, 1951, 61 to 1980 compared to uh, 1990 to uh, 2020. And you can see we've gone from blue and pink to bright red. So the global mean temperature has increased by 1.2 degrees Celsius. And this can be even felt in the United States. On the right, you can see precipitation because a warming world will increase evaporation. So you can see that in Minnesota, we have more precipitation in the last 30 years compared to the 30 years previous to that, and much more precipitation here in the Northeast. But the uh, mega drought of the Southwest has intensified, particularly over the last two decades in the Colorado River Basin, as you've heard in California, uh, and the Southwest. The cause of all of this heating is uh, greenhouse gases. The greenhouse gases uh, per, uh, form a layer where the visible light comes through the sky 
and its infrared radiation that hits the surface of the earth and bounces back up to this greenhouse gas layer, and then is reflected back to the surface of the earth, causing global warming. Uh, the main greenhouse gas has been increasing as shown on this chart on the left called the Keeling Curve uh, that was started by Charles Keeling in 1958 and 59 in the International Geophysical Year when he invented a machine to measure CO2 at the summit of Mauna Loa where he thought there would be clean air uh, and measured a value of about 310 parts per million. He was able to keep measuring this year by year and most recently, it's hit almost 420 parts per million, uh, more than a 40% increase. The problem with CO2 is that's a long-lived gas. You can see on the lower right that at the end of 100 years, 33% of it is still up in the sky. So it's very different than air pollution. On the upper right, you can see that in light blue, 80% of the greenhouse gases are, are, uh, is CO2. But there are uh, three other important ones. The dark blue is methane. You've heard a lot about methane lately, but it's 80 times more potent than CO2 in causing global, global warming over a 10 year period. It comes from oil and gas drilling, particularly fracking, uh, pipelines, uh, end users and furnaces and stoves, and also from landfills and even from cattle with their burping on uh, farms. Uh, and green is N2O, nitrous oxide, which primarily comes from uh, farming uh, with fertilizer and rice paddies being the main uh, uh, emitters. In red is a very important potent greenhouse gas and they're called the Montreal Protocol trace gases. Those are the chlorofluorocarbons that we used uh, for refrigerants and air conditioning sets. Uh, unfortunately, the chlorofluorocarbons would destroy ozone and cause an ozone hole. So the chemistry uh, protagonist uh, changed uh, to hydrochlorofluorocarbons and hydrofluorocarbons, which did not destroy ozone. Uh, that improvement, however, was a real tragedy for global warming since these compounds were 2000 times more potent than CO2. Uh, we are now changing uh, to isobutane and propane and hydrofluorolefins. And to accelerate that, uh, we have a protocol, originally the Montreal Protocol in 1988, but now the Kigali Agreement to phase out all of these chemicals. This is a treaty that requires two thirds of the Senate, uh, which is, as you know, probably impossible to achieve. So it was added uh, as a special uh, American uh, Innovation and Manufacturing Act to the omnibus bill that passed December 27th was signed by uh, Trump uh, so that we got this uh, uh, Kigali agreement uh, into law. A week ago, the EPA has put out uh, regulations for these chemical compounds. Fossil fuels, as you've heard, are the main causes of uh, CO2 and methane. And here you can see on the right that since about 1960, uh, we've had a tremendous increase in coal, oil, and gas production, uh, causing uh, this anthropogenic uh, production of CO2. On the left, you can see that in a cumulative manner, the United States has been the number one emitter over time. EU the second, China third, Russia fourth. Uh, more recently, China has passed the United States as being the major emitter and India has moved up to fourth position primarily from all their uh, coal production. So we have a national climate assessment that comes out uh, every few years. And uh, we're currently in uh, writing the fifth uh, national climate assessment, assessment. But these have shown on the left that uh, global warming is primarily human caused in the production of uh, uh, fossil fuel emissions. And on the right, you can see that most of these emissions are now from the transportation sector, automobiles, uh, second electricity sector in green uh, for coal fired and natural gas fired power plants, industry 22%, primarily steel and cement, uh, agriculture, uh, 
and building sector. Uh, so in planning uh, changes to policy, one has to keep in mind all of these uh, prospects. So global warming has really heated up the world. Uh, most of this heat has been stored in the ocean, 90%. Uh, the total heat gain is something like 358 zettajoules. Uh, if you're like me, I, don't, I really can't picture a zettajoule. And you might imagine that that would be the equivalent of four Hiroshima atomic bombs going off every second for 25 years. That kind of gets your attention about how we've really heated up the planet. So for public health, our first major uh, concern is uh, heat waves and increased uh, number of hot days. Uh, this has become uh, the deadliest of weather related hazards in the United States. And you can see it's uh, primarily across the center part of uh, the globe. We've had heat waves uh, uh, in a number of key areas. The famous one was in August, 2003 in France where the mean maximum temperature exceeded the seasonal norm by 11 to 12 degrees Celsius on nine consecutive days. There were 15,000 excess deaths in France, uh, 32,000 in Western Europe. And these were primarily due to heat stroke, hyperthermia, dehydration, uh, chronic respiratory disease, heart failure, stroke. This is primarily among the elderly and the lack of air conditioning was a, a key uh, challenge. Uh, more recently, we had that heat dome in Portland and Seattle in British Columbia, where there were about a thousand deaths this past summer. Uh, cities like Minneapolis and St. Paul will have a urban heat island profile from the buildings and parking lots. It'll be lower in the suburbs where there are trees. And uh, there are disparities in relation to heat in cities. Uh, this is a map of uh, Richmond, uh, Virginia. On the right, you can see what's called redlining. Uh, this is from the 1930s where the federal government guaranteed mortgages and they redlined areas that were poor. Uh, those also turned out to be uh, areas of persons of color, primarily black. And uh, green was uh, more wealthy areas. Those turned out to be right white primarily. Uh, on the left, you can see red, the, the hotter areas were in the red line districts, and that's where there would be more ambulance with heat stroke patients. Blue was uh, less uh, hot. And if you look at the impervious surface surfaces on the lower right, you can see that the red line areas had more asphalt and highways and things of that nature, whereas the suburbs uh, had more trees and greenery on the upper left. So Minneapolis was a heavily redlined city, uh, as you may imagine, as well as uh, Portland, Oregon, where much of the conflict uh, over the past year uh, occurred. So those areas are also uh, areas where uh, there's increased air pollution. Uh, this is a slide looking at particulate matter. That's the uh, most uh, concerning air pollutant for causing cardiopulmonary mortality. Uh, the Particles that are 2.5 microns and smaller are what get into the lower lungs and are absorbed into the blood, causing cardiac and pulmonary mortality. But we've been pretty good with our Clean Air Act. Uh, as you can see in the upper right, uh, the uh, PM 2.5 has been declining over the last uh, 40 years. Although in the upper left, you can see it's still pretty intense in the eastern third of the country in California. Uh, if you look at uh, districts uh, where there are air pollution monitors, uh, the most polluted areas in uh, 1981 uh, were still the most polluted areas in uh, 2016, 36 years later, despite uh, as shown in the bottom here that all of these areas had about a 40% improvement. So here in the middle, you can see that uh, the areas that uh, had the least uh, uh, change in PM uh, were still the uh, cleanest and the dirtiest were still the dirtiest uh, over 36 years. So disparity, disparities persist in air pollution. On the right is the mortality curve from cardiopulmonary disease related to particulate matter concentration on the uh, x-axis and the hazard ratio risk for death from these diseases on the ordinate. Uh, the standard in the U.S. has always been around 15 
micrograms per meter cubed. Um, under Obama, uh, there was a big push to lower this, and Obama lowered it to 12. Uh, the World Health Organization is at 10. But as you can see, this is a straight line uh, relationship, and our standard should really be lowered from 12 to 10 or maybe even down to 8. Interestingly, if this were to happen, uh, that would not only clean up power plants, but it would also reduce CO2 pollution uh, dramatically. So under uh, Biden, uh, the PM 2.5 standard is going to be reevaluated, as well as the ozone standard. So that'll be occurring over the next year. So PM 2.5 is not only from transportation and power plants, uh, a major uh, source is now wildfire smoke. And we had this in Ely all summer. We got it from uh, fires in Aquatico that were just north of Crooked Lake that went all the way up to uh, Sturgeon and uh, here even up to uh, Lonely Lake in that area. So a lot of the Aquatico burned and that smoke came down to Ely. Uh, and then we had the Greenwood fire south of Ely that closed Highway 1. Uh, we had smoke coming from both directions and Ely was full of uh, firefighters uh, sleeping in their tents on the uh, college campus uh, at Vermilion. Uh, but if you look at the mortality and morbidity from wildfire smoke, uh, the wildfire season has increased by uh, more than two months. The average duration of fires has increased fivefold. You can probably remember that the area of these fires has increased from about half a million acres to four to five million acres every summer now. There's an interesting study uh, uh, in a journal of the American Heart Association that looked at a time series analysis that found California wildfires in 2015 were significantly associated with emergency department visits for ischemic heart disease, dysrhythmia, heart failure, pulmonary embolism, stroke, and respiratory conditions, especially if you're more than 65 years of age. So going forward, what are we expecting in heat? Uh, if the temperature uh, continues to rise to up to three degrees Celsius, uh, heat wave exposure is gonna be like eight out of 11 billion people in 2100, there'll be water stress, uh, there'll be risk to power production because so many air conditioners, crop yield change, habitat degradation. Uh, the UN with the current uh, Glasgow uh, commitments say that we might lower this three degrees to two seven or two four, uh, but we're still uh, not on track to decarbonize. So the second public health uh, concern, or the third after air pollution and heat waves is uh, extreme weather. These are examples of uh, Hurricane Sandy that hit New York. On the left is, are the ambulances evacuating NYU Hospital. On the right is the surge of uh, 14 feet that flooded Bellevue Hospital. Uh, so I worked at Bellevue for 25 years as head of the chest service. And I had seven freezers full of research samples and the freezers were at risk of uh, uh, stopping uh, uh, electricity. The uh, flooding uh, flooded the uh, basement of Bellevue. The elevators were then uh, shorted out. Uh, the diesel emergency generators were on the 13th floor, but the elevators and the pumps weren't working to bring diesel up to the generators. So the lights uh, would flicker out after about 24 hours. Uh, the pumps were out for bringing water up to the 22nd floor that would, uh, by gravity, flush a thousand toilets. So a thousand toilets wouldn't flush after uh, uh, 24 hours. So all these hospitals had to be evacuated. You can imagine uh, the challenge to get patients transferred to other hospitals, but we had months uh, without uh, having patients to uh, train our fellows. So we had to... Uh, mobilize other hospitals to uh, help with all of that effort. A fourth uh, area of uh, concern is uh, food insecurity. Uh, this is what's happening in uh, Africa. Some of the currents in the Indian Ocean provide a cold blob that provide uh, drought conditions to parts of uh, South Africa. Uh, Southern Madagascar is in a severe famine right now. Uh, some of these warm blobs br bring too much water to crops like in Kenya, where they have uh, huge uh, locust uh, outbreaks that uh, eat their corn. And the heat uh, in general will reduce uh, crop uh, uh, quantities by five to 
So ecological changes include uh, loss of ice, our glaciers are melting. Uh, on the left is uh, what's happening to Kilimanjaro. Uh, the ice, about 11 square meters, will decline to zero in the next few years. In 1970, as a uh, University of Minnesota third year medical student, I went to uh, Tanzania and climbed Kilimanjaro. Uh, that's me on the left in 1970 with a nice big glacier behind me. Uh, then I got married and had uh, Nicole, who works at Climate Chen in Minneapolis. Uh, 29 years later, she was at Bates and did a semester at uh, Tanzania. And you can see at Uhuru Point that uh, the glacier is gone. Uh, this photograph, interestingly, was uh, used for the first debate on the floor of the United States Senate uh, in uh, 2003 for the McCain-Lieberman uh, cap-and-trade bill. I was on sabbatical with Senator Clinton and talked her staff and the senator into giving a speech on the floor of the Senate. And at 8 o'clock at night, uh, she gave her five minutes uh, bashing uh, George W. Bush and et cetera. Uh, but McCain, uh, Lieberman, uh, Clinton, and Rom were the last four people on the floor of the Senate, so I was able to meet uh, all of those distinguished individuals. Uh, so glaciers are disappearing. Glacier National Park is at risk. Uh, this huge glacier that came up to the uh, Alsic River in uh, near Alaska uh, and uh, the Yukon uh, was gigantic and photographed in 1906 by the International Border Survey. And uh, this was found by a friend of mine, Neil Hartling, who runs uh, raft services in Canada. And I had canoed with him uh, down the South Nahani and uh, Northwest Territories. But after seeing that picture, I wanted to visit, see what happened to that huge glacier. And I rafted with him down the Elsick River. And there's the uh, Elsick Glacier way back away from the river with a huge lake uh, between it and the Elsick River. The other big glaciers are in Greenland and Antarctica, and the question is Greenland melting. Uh, in the Arctic, you've all heard that the uh, Arctic uh, ice is melting. So this is the uh, minima of the ice in uh, September. Uh, it was about 11 million square kilometers. Now it gets down to 4 million square kilometers. Uh, this is uh, uh, 20, uh, 20 Arctic ice extent in blue. You can see it's... Uh, a uh, dramatic uh, loss of uh, surface melting, uh, uh, surface floating ice. But Greenland is more important because if uh, the Greenland ice sheet were to melt, it would uh, raise mean global sea level by over seven meters. That's uh, over 20 feet. I'd be underwater where I am right now in New York City. Uh, so you can see on the right that uh, there's surface melt and uh, melting from the warm water where the glaciers uh, come down from the land and uh, meet the water in, uh, at the end of fjords. Uh, thousands of gigatons of ice have been lost. And uh, here's a picture of me looking at one of these glaciers near Thule or Kanak, where uh, Paul Shirky, who you all probably know uh, in the Friends, uh, led an expedition that I joined uh, to go on a spring hunt with the uh, Thule Inuit. And uh, we had eight uh, dog sleds with 120 dogs. And uh, the Thule Inuit are incredible since they are hunters for seals and walrus and uh, wear uh, polar uh, bear uh, leggings and sealskin tops and speak their own Thule language. Uh, that culture will disappear as uh, the ice melts and they're unable to hunt uh, for polar bears. So looking at the other uh, extreme on the Antarctic, uh, you've heard that uh, the ice shelves have been melting and crashing. These are ice shelves on the right that broke up in 2002 along the uh, Antarctic Peninsula, which has warmed more than two degrees Celsius. But the real concern is down here at the Amundsen Sea where it's in red and uh, the ice shelf here is beginning to uh, melt. And there's two glaciers, the Pine Island and the Thwaites Glacier uh, that will uh, have their grounding line melt by this warm uh, seawater. And you'll see that uh, satellite images show that the Pine Island Glacier here is uh, cracking and breaking up as it advances. 
And the same with the Thwaites Glacier that uh, as it advances, it begins to break up and, and shed huge icebergs. So is this a point of no return for the Antarctic? Uh, this is a uh, hysteresis uh, diagram. And if the uh, temperature goes up to two degrees Celsius, the hysteresis predicts over here with my arrow, uh, more than 2.5 meters of sea level rise. Uh, so if we hit that uh, by 2050, we uh, could have flooding of uh, low lying areas like this is in Florida. So this is six feet, that's two meters. Most predictions are below one meter for 2100. But if it were two meters, uh, we lose the Everglades and Miami is way over here. So the trend right now is up to about eight inches of sea level rise from uh, this warmth uh, sea expansion and the melting of uh, land-based glaciers and then Greenland and the Antarctic uh, ice uh, sheets. So the CO2 absorption into the water uh, occurs as well as the heat, uh, a third or more of it is absorbed into the water, but this can form a weak acid called carbonic acid. And uh, carbonic acid is bad for uh, marine organisms that need calcium carbonate for their shells, uh, as you can see on the right. But the warmth of the seawater also causes bleaching of corals and a quarter of uh, the world's fishes uh, uh, are born and live in the coral reefs. Uh, continued bleaching will result in the death of coral reefs and peoples in Philippines, the Caribbean, uh, Indonesia uh, uh, would suffer from greater food insecurity. So there are a number of uh, tipping points other than uh, melting of these huge ice shelves. Another is loss of forests. Uh, <clears throat> forests uh, capture CO2 and are responsible for uh, a major uh, carbon sink uh, primarily in Brazil, the Congo, and then the taiga forests of Canada and uh, Russia, uh, and our own taiga forests of northeastern Minnesota. But in the Amazon, you can see we've lost maybe a, a fifth or more of this due to logging and uh, soy production and cattle ranching. And you can see it's uh, uh, encroaching from uh, the south primarily in Bolivia as well as uh, Brazil. And you can see that it's uh, encroaching upon these uh, uh, striped areas that are indigenous territories. So the way to really preserve the forest is uh, through these indigenous territories uh, and keep them intact. Uh, the data uh, for number of fires and loss of uh, acreage uh, from logging and farming uh, suggests that uh, we're encroaching upon 20% at, at more than 20% loss of this forest. The carbon sink will turn into a, a savanna and a carbon source. So we are close to a tipping point in the Amazon. It's good that in, uh, uh, Glasgow, uh, Brazil joined Canada and Russia to protect their forests by 2030. Uh, but as in everything, a commitment needs uh, action. A further tipping point is something of concern called permafrost. Uh, if any of you have paddled to the uh, Hudson Bay or Northern Canada, and you put your hand down in those bogs, it's really ice cold as you touch that ice, that's all permafrost. So permafrost uh, across the uh, tundra of the north uh, is uh, frozen solid year round, but it's beginning to thaw because of the high temperature. And uh, as it thaws, it uh, puts at risk uh, about 1,600 billion uh, tons of uh, uh, potential CO2 and methane. And uh, uh, this could be a major concern. Currently, uh, it's infrastructure at risk, uh, such as the Trans-Alaska Pipeline, roads, buildings, uh, indigenous communities are, are having problems with their buildings tipping and uh, uh, sea level rise and surges that several indigenous communities in Alaska now are planning to move. Okay, what is the policy? So. Uh, the market is doing a lot. Here you can see that uh, renewables in black have been increasing every single year. So wind and solar are uh, replacing coal-fired power plants and gas-fueled uh, power plants. But as you can see in the bottom, 
uh, uh, gas, oil, and coal are, are gargantuan uh, uh, sources of uh, fossil fuels compared to the small amount of other renewables. And the real problem is China, India, Japan, Russia, and Germany all still burning coal. Uh, 40 countries in Glasgow now want to uh, eliminate coal consumption, but that doesn't include China or India or the US uh, or Russia. Uh, but at least there are commitments now by China uh, and the U.S. to stop uh, funding coal-fired power plants uh, uh, in other countries. Looking at uh, uh, President Biden's goal of uh, having a uh, renewable energy source of electricity uh, dominate by 2035, uh, you can see the good news that power plant CO2 emissions are going to be in decreasing uh, from coal and uh, uh, natural gas uh, going forward. And actually by 2035, uh, many of the coal plants in black and the natural gas uh, power plants in red are gonna be reaching the end of their uh, life. And uh, if we can build out uh, wind and solar farms over the next uh, 15 years, we can replace that. Uh, also small modular nuclear would, would be acceptable. Uh, so that we have a chance here uh, if we're able to stimulate the market and get some uh, bills passed through Congress. Uh, but to build out wind and solar is a huge challenge. This is a New York Times map uh, from late May this year. As you can see where wind and solar is today. Uh, Minnesota does pretty well. Iowa does really well. Texas and the Great Plains, there's virtually nothing offshore. But this is where we need to be uh, at, at, to be at zero uh, carbon in 2050. So it's a huge uh, production of wind turbines in the Midwest, solar in the Southeast, solar in California. And you can see that we really need to develop those uh, 30 gigawatts of uh, offshore wind on the East Coast, uh, which is a gold mine for the East Coast. The challenge in doing this is uh, money, workers, factories, manufacturing. Uh, it's also a challenge called NIMBY or not in my backyard. We have to get uh, uh, transmission lines to deliver this uh, power to cities. Uh, so the federal government could have a key role there. Importantly uh, for the marketplace, uh, solar and wind has declined in uh, uh, money uh, that uh, 43 or $42 per kilowatt hour uh, compared to coal, which is uh, more than double. Uh, so that uh, wind and solar are now competitive with natural gas uh, so that uh, uh, the Minnesota Public Utility Commission now can uh, get their uh, uh, opportunities uh, to promote renewables throughout Minnesota and also in uh, neighboring states uh, because it's cheaper. Okay. What is the problem going forward? Well, uh, President Biden says we're gonna bring manufacturing back to the US, but the polycrystalline uh, uh, for making uh, uh, solar panels is produced in Xinjiang in Western China, uh, where they have Uyghur, Uyghurs uh, doing the uh, manufacturing. Uh, they say they're providing jobs for the Uyghurs. Uh, we say this is a human rights violation because they're given no choice. But the uh, wafers, the modules, the panels are 80% produced in China. Uh, I visited Jinko, uh, the, one of the world's largest solar factories, uh, uh, halfway between Shanghai and Wuhan uh, in 2020, and uh, uh, was very impressed with the incredible factory and their manufacturing skills. So the Chinese are able to produce these in large quantities and high quality and, and low price. Uh, they're at... Uh, they were over 400 uh, watts per uh, panel. And uh, at my cabin in Ely, I have six uh, General Electric American made panels. Uh, and they're only 150 watts. They're more than 10 years old. You can see that technology has really improved. So the other big uh, challenge is transportation and getting uh, our cars and trucks to uh, electric uh, vehicles and batteries uh, made from lithium. Uh, you can see that China uh, plans to really 
uh, zero in on EVs and uh, be the world's leading producer. In light yellow, you can see that uh, uh, Europe is uh, also uh, building out with Volkswagen, uh, Mercedes-Benz, uh, Renault. Uh, North America is just this little gray area up here with my arrow so that GM and Ford uh, have uh, a real challenge ahead of them. Uh, to compete with China. So President Biden uh, has been active in trying to uh, uh, meet this existential crisis of climate change and put the country on a forward path to renewables. Uh, he has a huge challenge ahead of him. Uh, you can see that uh, the historical emissions at about 40 uh, billion tons of uh, metric tons of CO2 is uh, going upward every single year. Copenhagen did a little. The Paris pledges uh, were significant. Uh, they would have lowered emissions uh, substantially, but uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has showed that to stay at 1.5 degrees, we need to be uh, at half uh, the current emissions by 2030, uh, and that's a huge challenge. So there's a roadmap. The International en Energy Agency made a roadmap for the 1.5 degree goal and trying to keep uh, the temperature below two degrees uh, Celsius. Uh, this roadmap for 1.5 is uh, pretty extreme. That means this year, stop approving new coal plants, stop approving the development of new oil and gas fields. That's this year, no more new oil and gas and no more uh, sales of uh, BLM land in Wyoming and Montana uh, and Utah for oil and gas, no more sales of uh, Gulf of Mexico oil and gas. 2025, ban the sale of new oil and gas furnaces to heat buildings instead, uh, switch to cleaner electric heat pumps. I would add hot water heaters and gas stoves. Uh, a third of the houses in uh, our, uh, the US are, uh, cook, have cooking with gas stoves. New York City is 70%. Uh, so we really need to switch to electric uh, uh, stoves. I bought a new uh, electric stove for my cabin last summer, uh, and I love it. It really is uh, as good as gas. Uh, I just bought an electric stove to replace my gas one in my apartment here in New York. Uh, so uh, we all can do our little uh, bit. So in 2030, we have to have electric vehicles making up 60% of new car sales from 5% today. By 2035, uh, we need to stop selling gasoline or diesel fueled passenger vehicles. We need millions of charging stations. Uh, I envision coming to a rest area, driving up from Minneapolis to Ely and looking at 100 uh, charging stations at the rest area on the freeway, and then a big uh, uh, wind turbine and a battery providing a, a direct current uh, to charge up our vehicles in 20 minutes to get a full charge. Uh, 2035, zero out emissions from power plants, shifting away from coal to technologies like wind, solar, uh, small modular nuclear or carbon capture. Uh, by 2040, all remaining coal-fired power plants are closed or retrofitted with carbon capture technology. Also by 2035, we have to work on trucks and by 24, uh, aviation uh, fuel needs to be sustainable. And we have to start looking at hydrogen uh, for some of these uh, heavier uh, vehicles and planes. So Senator Nelson and the founder of Earth Day said the ultimate test of man's conscience may be his willingness to sacrifice something today for future generations whose words of thanks will not be heard. So Gaylord Nelson was the founder of Earth Day and I remember in 1970 on Earth Day, there were 20 million people uh, demonstrating. And uh, I held a uh, symposium at uh, Northrop uh, Auditorium at the University of Minnesota uh, with Bill McGee and, and several people about the uh, Boundary Waters canoe area. And in 1970, our, our big concern was logging. And uh, we had a, a, a good time uh, coming up with a, a lot of uh, pro-environmental stands that were incorporated in the 1978 law uh, a few years later. So thank you. Great, and I can jump in here for this last few slides. Um, thank you for a great presentation and thanks for everyone for tuning in. Um, before we get to q and I will just um, go through kind of a couple things here, but invite you to put your questions um, into that feature now. 
um, so we can get to as many as we can. Um, so if you were on yesterday's presentation with Dr. Steve Emmerman, you would have heard about um, one of the kind of most direct connections between our work at the Friends and a lot of the work to fight climate change is through fighting copper sulfide mining. Um, if twin metals and polymet, these proposed copper sulfide mines were to go online, it would be the equivalent of adding like half a million um, cars onto Minnesota roads each year in terms of carbon emissions. Um, and so that's kind of one thing that we're really working directly on to um, stop these mines before they get built. Um, it has a clean water impact. It also has a very um, big climate impact. Um, so to get involved in some of that work, I encourage everyone to um, look into our Prove It First law. So this is a law that we're trying to pass in the Minnesota legislature. Um, that would help kind of bring science into the permitting process more than it is um, and require anyone wanting to build a copper sulfide mine to have more proof that it can be done safely. Um, I also would ask folks to uh, become a Prove It First delegate. So this will be a delegate at your local precinct caucus this winter. And you'll basically stand up and say, hey, I support clean water and I support this Prove It First bill. So if anyone wants more information about that, you can email me. Uh, my info is on the screen there. And then if you would just go to the next slide. Great, thank you. And then kind of one last pitch is that um, Give to the Max Day, which is one of our biggest fundraising days um, in the whole year is coming up on next week, November 18th. Um, and so that's a really great opportunity for you to kind of pitch in and help us continue both bringing presentations like this to um, our Friends of the Boundary Water supporters, but also continue our work to stop sulfide mining to protect the environment of northern Minnesota. Um, so with, with those pitches aside, um, I think we can go ahead and stop the screen share and I will start to take some questions. Um, I also wanted to just shout out a couple of the comments that were kind of popping up in the chat throughout the presentation so far. I know a lot of people mentioning the smoke that they've been seeing over the summers, especially this past summer in northern Minnesota, and that, you know, really kind of bringing home this idea that, that climate is already impacting our health in ways that we can see and recognize. Um, I also noticed um, Jackie in the chat had made a comment about line three and saying, you know, something really impactful right now that everyone can do is to tell elected leaders in Minnesota that you don't support line three. It's um, you know, not a good thing for our climate. Um, and so that, um, you know, calling on all of you to take action on that is another way to, to jump in and help. Um, so I will, let's see, uh, scroll through this chat here and see some questions. I see a question from Risa who asks, Dr. Ram, you mentioned something about Indigenous communities planning to move, um, and I, I'm not exactly sure what that was in reference to, but wondering if, if you have more information about what that looks like, or could point uh, Risa in, towards an article about that. In the infrastructure bill uh, just passed by Congress, there's over uh, 45 billion for uh, adaptation to climate change. In there, there's money to move uh, several communities that are at risk for sea level rise. Uh, one is in uh, Louisiana, uh, where uh, the land is sinking and the uh, sea is rising and uh, they have increased floods and uh, they are attached to their communities, uh, but they are considering, considering moving the entire town. Uh, the indigenous communities in Alaska include several uh, small towns uh, in the Aleut region on the uh, western shore where there's uh, not only sea level rise, but uh, increased storms and uh, increased surges so that the beach is being eroded and then the land is being eroded and numbers of the houses are now uh, uh, overlooking uh, uh, air and are, are eroded, so they have to move uh, inland. Uh, so that's taking place. In Canada, uh, one of the rivers to Hudson Bay had a huge ice jam at the source and flooded uh, the community of Winisk, and they, the Canadians moved Winisk 
to Piwanak uh, further upstream. So uh, all of this is uh, uh, changing and affecting uh, indigenous communities. Great, yeah, thank you for that answer. Um, a, a question I had, and I think I saw somebody else kind of mention this in the comments as well, but would you just talk a little bit more about, you know, changes that you've seen in the Ely area? I know you've grown up in Ely and have often been back there to visit, um, you know, changes related to health and climate that you've noticed or that you expect to see um, coming up in the, in the coming decades. Yes. So I, I'm one of uh, many cabin owners uh, who go and spend uh, summers in uh, Ely. Uh, every summer, everybody uh, spends uh, thousands of dollars fixing up their cabin, doing some landscaping and what have you. Uh, so I noted uh, beginning about 20 years ago that uh, straight line derecho storms would come through with howling winds upwards of 60 to 70 miles an hour knocking over uh, spruces, balsams, uh, cutting cedars in half, and uh, breaking off uh, aspen trees at the mid-level. Uh, these are trees that were probably uh, 100 years old since the logging era of uh, 1910. Uh, so this is something really uh, never seen before. Uh, last summer, there was a derecho storm that uh, uh, affected the blueberry festival, destroying many of the booths. Uh, 16 of my biggest trees came down. And fortunately I had good terms with the uh, Fenske uh, Tree Service and they spent a full day clearing out the trees. Uh, so that's one thing, but uh, everybody noted it was really, really hot in Ely last summer. And I've been on a few trips over the past uh, half dozen years where the lakes are dead still and the sun is beating down. And I've never experienced such heat in Ely before. And then drought, uh, this past summer we had a drought and now I'm uh, trying to plant flowers and trees on my property and, and uh, there was just no rain all summer. So we are being affected directly by climate change. And I might say that uh, in Northern Minnesota, uh, mining is huge uh, and there are six, uh, uh, taconite uh, mines with uh, production of the pellets. And they've always used uh, coal dust to uh, uh, produce their taconite pellets and they've just switched to natural gas. So somebody needs to start looking at electrification of this mining business so that uh, uh, they aren't producing uh, NO2, NO uh, particulates and uh, particularly mercury uh, that uh, uh, extends uh, into the atmosphere over uh, uh, the boundary waters. Yeah, and I think, I mean, there's so many, unfortunately, so many ways that we are seeing it already and that it is impacting. I know somebody commented on fires and having to run sprinkler systems a lot more than they ever had before because of the heat and being worried about fires. Um, also, I just wanted to mention that we do have another presentation tomorrow that will kind of more directly address um, some of the ecological impacts that the Boundary Waters area will, will see in the future. Um, and so that is with Dr. Lee Freelich from the University of Minnesota. Um, and he'll be talking about, you know, kind of from an ecological standpoint, what, will, what tree species will be around, what animals will be able to um, survive kind of in, in these different climate conditions. Um, so I will um, add a link to that in the chat here. Um, this is just a place to sign up for tomorrow's Zoom. Um, if anyone wants to attend that, that will be tomorrow at noon as well. Um, to get back to a few of the other questions that I've seen, somebody was asking um, if you have tips for, for dealing with climate skeptics who say that, um, I'm trying to find the exact words, but to who say that, um, you know, this is, uh, let's see, glaciers growing, high CO2 is good for plant growth, kind of some of the other arguments that people maybe have uh, um, to, to climate change, if you have advice for, for dealing with that conversation. So after I play nine holes of golf in Ely, I sit down with uh, all the uh, white uh, Elyites who are uh, pretty far to the right wing and uh, sit down with a cup of coffee and I start talking to them about climate change. Uh, what seems to work with them is I take out my cell phone and I show them 
uh, the temperature going up. I show them the uh, CO2 going up with the Keeling curve, and they've never seen it before. So they're receptive to information. But I think the real kicker here is to talk to them about their children. What kind of uh, planet do they uh, want their children and grandchildren to inherit? Uh, probably that has more impact on Republicans and populists than uh, beating them over the head. They do care about the future and uh, that may be a compelling argument. Great, yeah, I think, I think that makes a lot of sense. <clears throat> Excuse me. Let's see, what other questions do I see here? We do have a lot in the chat, which is great, but I'm um, just trying to scroll through to see what people have mentioned. Um, I see in the Q&A, somebody had asked, or they're saying solar panels are great, renewable and clean. How, however, the ingredients required are um, not necessarily renewable and clean and are needed to be mined. How do we go about this? Um, and wonder if, if you have thoughts on that. <laughs> Uh, that, that is a uh, challenging question. Uh, I always sign up for uh, Great Decisions, uh, which is a uh, organization that puts great uh, questions uh, to people to think about and talk. And there's usually about 40 mm -hmm. people on Great Decisions. And I keep making the argument as a uh, eighth district uh, person in Minnesota, where I grew up, where everything is uh, union and uh, democratic and uh, that uh, we should have uh, manufacturing back in this country and make things and uh, uh, on great decisions. Uh, I'm like one out of 40 and the other 39 say, well, America is now a service industry country. Uh, China makes things and uh, they do it more cheaply and better than we do. And uh, uh, that we should stay as a service country. Uh, I have a hard time with that because uh, I think we still need to make things and, and support our supply chains. Uh, one argument that uh, the mining industry always makes is that they're more environmental in the America. There's a huge lithium mine proposed north of Winnemucca, Nevada, that uh, the indigenous community is very much opposed to. So we, we're going to have to uh, think about uh, how we're going to go about this, whether we're going to import panels from uh, China and whether we're gonna manufacture our wind turbines in the US. Uh, for, wind, for the offshore wind here in New York uh, and uh, the East Coast, you have to have special uh, ships to haul these huge steel uh, turbines and uh, uh, piles uh, out to uh, 300 feet or so of water. And with the first five wind turbines built uh, off Rhode Island's Narragansett Bay, we didn't have any ships. And this is because of the Jones Act that requires uh, our ports and our shipping to be done in American ships. So the builders of the wind turbine farm offshore in Rhode Island took a European ship, brought it to Halifax and brought in wind turbines from Halifax, Nova Scotia, put them in the ocean and then went back to Canada. So we're gonna to have to build ships. Uh, we're gonna to have to have uh, ports that are uh, uh, renovated. This will occur in some of the uh, infrastructure bill. New York uh, and New Jersey are already fighting over uh, ports for wind turbines and building out uh, uh, an industry to put in offshore wind. So I think uh, there'll probably be a mixture of uh, American manufacturing and uh, importation of some of these things uh, over the next 10 years. We only have 10 years to do this. So wind and solar are the only uh, options that are ready. Uh, modular, small nuclear plants uh, are on the drawing board, but it'll take 10 years for any of those to be built. Uh, at Glasgow, uh, John Kerry just shook hands with uh, the prime minister of Romania uh, for new scale to build one of these small modular nuclear reactors in Romania. So there's uh, uh, a major effort to move forward. And I think it's going to happen on multiple fronts. Uh, the most important thing is uh, to go green. Yeah, thanks. I think that's a lot of, yeah, really interesting points about how we should be thinking about this. And just to add something that we often talk about at the Friends is the potential for metal recycling, especially you know, copper recycling or other things 
um, that is in some ways an untapped resource um, that, you know, in increasing the ways and the efficiency that we recycle metal will allow us to kind of have both the technologies that we need um, and protect clean water in really special places like this. Um, jumping back down to the chat, somebody had a question. Is there any relation between climate change and increased likelihood of world health crises, such as the pandemic that we are in the midst of now? I think it's critical to uh, prepare uh, for uh, emergencies such as this. Uh, we had uh, international health uh, regulations that uh, the United States was the leader in, uh, yet we had the worst uh, outcome of any country in the world with uh, COVID-19. Uh, we have over 750,000 deaths and a uh, not only a pandemic, but a uh, misinformation uh, pandemic. Uh, so uh, for the climate change crisis, uh, we need to have uh, all hands on deck. Uh, we need to convince uh, uh, the independent voter and, and as many Republicans as we can that uh, this needs to be uh, a top priority. Uh, we need to get the government on board. We need to get the business and banking industry on board. Uh, and uh, the uh, nexus between uh, COVID-19 and climate change is probably best seen in uh, air pollution, where fossil fuel, uh, particulate matter, 2.5 microns in size, uh, has increased the risk for uh, getting uh, infected with COVID-19 and increased the risk for hospitalization and death. And uh, you can see this in the counties with the highest PM 2.5 level have the highest uh, COVID rates as well. Uh, so uh, there is a, a relationship between air pollution and COVID. Uh, also, when the shutdown occurred, uh, PM 2.5 and nitrogen oxides uh, declined dramatically, but they've all gone back up uh, uh, with the economy reopening. Uh, CO2 emissions went down about 6 or 7%, but they're already uh, back up. So uh, the biggest uh, relationship is uh, public health preparedness. Uh, and we are uh, once again, not funding public health agencies at the level we should. The, uh, both the infrastructure bill and the Build Back Better Act have a lot of money for CDC to uh, filter down to state and local public health agencies. But in Montana and a few places uh, just west of uh, uh, Minnesota, a lot of the local public health agencies are, are losing uh, leaders and uh, losing funding uh, because of the misinformation pandemic. So uh, we have a lot of work to do. Yeah, well, I see that we are kind of getting towards the end of the hour here. Um, so I wanna be respectful of everyone's time, um, but thank you so much for this presentation. Thank you for everyone who's tuning in. I encourage folks to yeah, to, to stay engaged, um, whether that's continuing to engage with Friends of the Boundary Waters or finding other climate related organizations um, in your own communities that, that are doing this work, um, encourage folks to, to yeah, stay engaged with that. Um, as I mentioned before, we do have one final presentation um, in our Climate Week series coming up tomorrow at noon. Um, and you should, if you got the email about this, you should see the, the information to sign up for that. Um, so I hope you'll be able to join us for that as well. Um, yeah, thank you again, Dr. Rahm, for a great presentation, very informative. Thank you, everybody, for joining, and have a great afternoon. Okay, thank you.